Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Well, the questions for chapter 22. Number one, some of us will be so disappointed if there's no need for food in heaven. Right, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> will we eat food when we possess our glorified bodies? That's my first question here. Number two, what's the best drink man ever tasted, and when will believers enjoy this drink? The tree of life plays a definite part in our endless existence. What is it? Will we ever need to be healed because of illness in the new Jerusalem? What is Christ's seal of eternal ownership for all eternity? Why will there be no night there during the glorious millennial day? The Apostle John commits a second boo-boo, if you will. Do you know what it is? What does the phrase, let him that is filthy be filthy still? What does it mean? Will one obtain life in the holy city because of commandment, observance, or because of another event? If so, what is it? Who misses living in the holy city and why? Who is the bright and morning star? Where and by whom is the final invitation given for salvation? And lastly, will God's judgment fall on those who mock or reject the book that we have been explaining to you, the book of Revelation? If so, should we not listen and obey? Jack, the last chapter of the book of Revelation, chapter 22. And this closing chapter of the book of Revelation continues our thrilling sightseeing tour of the New Jerusalem and reaffirms the fact that only those who possess the righteousness of Christ are granted admittance and residence. Verses 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The first two verses of chapter 22 establish the fact that in our new glorified bodies, we as inhabitants of the holy city will continue to enjoy the habit of eating. Why not? When we see Jesus, we shall be like him. 1 John 3, 2, since he ate in his glorified body, Luke 24, 43, why wouldn't we? Our text also describes the best drink we will ever enjoy, pure, refreshing water direct from the throne of God. Think of it. Distilled or chemically treated water is no longer necessary, for pollution has become non-existent. Not only do we have crystal clear water to drink, but we also enjoy delicious, health-producing fruit. In fact, the tree of life bears 12 manner of fruits and produces them monthly. This is interesting. When Adam and Eve sinned by partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2.17, God drove them out of the Garden of Eden. He then stationed an angel before his entrance in order to keep them from eating the fruit of the tree of life, lest they would eat and live eternally in their sinful state. Now, a new day has arrived. The saints are in the very presence of God and may eat of the tree of life to their heart's content. Undoubtedly, this tree then plays a part in promoting one's endless existence, for even the leaves contain healing or health for the nations living under or in the light of the city. The word health is the proper translation, not healing. Since there is no sorrow, sickness, or pain, healing is unnecessary because eternal health is for all. In the heavenly city, doctors and nurses are permanently retired. Hallelujah. Verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. The curse which originated in the Garden of Eden and was partially removed during the millennium is now obliterated forever. Verse 4, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Think of it. 
we will observe the beauty of our Savior's countenance daily as we live in His presence forever and ever. When we look at the one who is altogether lovely, and He in turn looks at us, He will observe His name indelibly inscribed upon our foreheads. This is our seal of eternal ownership. Oh, how wonderful to belong to Jesus. Verse 5, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever, because Christ in all His glory illuminates the city, its inhabitants, and those who walk in the light of the city. No other type of natural or artificial lighting is required. Even the sun which warmed the former earth for so many centuries is no longer necessary. The warmth of the love of God shines upon His people for the ages of ages in this land of eternal day. Verse 6, And He said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent His angel to show unto His servants the things which must shortly be done. At this point, the angel tells John the reason God has allowed him to experience this vision of the revelation. He says, The God of the holy prophets, who is truth and cannot lie, sent me to tell you that the things you have heard and seen must come to pass speedily. Then, verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. In verse 6, our Lord told John that the things written in this book of Revelation must shortly be done or come to pass speedily. Then he adds in verse 7, Behold, I come quickly or speedily. This is interesting. The term speedily is not used in relationship to hours, days, months, or even years. Rather, it speaks of a series of events happening in rapid succession once they begin. In other words, when these things begin to come to pass, Luke 21, 28, the signs and events will fall into place so speedily, one after the other, that a state of preparedness should be maintained. Hence the admonition, Blessed or happy is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Such an individual will be ready for the Lord's return. Verses 8 and 9, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. <laughs> Poor mortals never learn. John had already made the mistake of bowing before an angel and being rebuked in chapter 19, verse 10. Now he does it again. Fortunately, we have a God of love. He is willing to forgive the same mistake 70 times 7, Matthew 18, 22. Only by His grace, love, compassion, and forgiveness are any of us able to continue. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Verse 10, And He saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Following God's revelation to Daniel, the prophet was told to seal the book until the time of the end, Daniel 12, 4. John, however, is forbidden to seal the book of Revelation because the time is at hand or has come. In the Greek, the word time is keros and means opportune moment or correct season. Thus the angel is saying, the time for the revealing of prophetic truth has come. People are to be made aware of the future. They must learn the history of the churches and the plan of the ages. Then, as they live in these periods of time, they will understand God's program. They will also realize that once the events begin, they will speedily come to pass. Knowing this, they'll prepare. Therefore, do not seal the prophecy of the sayings of this book. Our study of the book of Revelation has revealed that the rapture, the tribulation, and the great white throne judgment will soon come to pass. As a result, some will realize that little time is left and ask Christ to save them. 
Others will continue to harden their hearts. The decision is every individual's to make. One's acceptance or rejection of God's truth and the Lord Jesus Christ as one's personal Savior will determine where one spends eternity and what one will be forever. Hence, the next statement, verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that's righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Choose this day what you shall be eternally. Verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. God's prophetic time clock is ticking, and every event will certainly and speedily come to pass. Verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. God is saying, when I come, I will finish the work of redemption which I began, for I am the Alpha and Omega, the author and finisher of the faith. Hebrews 12, 2. If you receive the gospel invitation, you will be happy for verse 14 declares, Blessed, happy are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Now, you've got to listen, folks. This is so important. According to Dr. C.I. Schofield, the better rendering is, Blessed are they that wash their robes, that they may have right to the tree of life. If one is seeking rights to the tree of life by commandment keeping, he's planning to arrive in the eternal state by his works. This, of course, is impossible. As we've learned through Titus 3, 5 and Romans 4, 5 and numerous other texts, Dr. A.C. Gabeline, Dr. H.A. Ironside, Dr. J.A. Cease, and practically all noted Bible scholars translate the verse as follows. Blessed are they that wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb, Christ, that, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Those who reject the message of the blood and salvation by grace through faith in the completed work of Christ, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, are reminded, verse 15, that outside, without, Heaven are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. This is the crowd pictured in Revelation 21.8. The dogs are identical to the abominable of chapter 21. The abominable never lived it. Titus 1.16. And the dogs went back to their dirt, their old sinful habits. 2 Peter 2.22. Both verses speak of individuals who lack the new birth experience. The one and only way a person can become a new creation in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.17. There's absolutely no doubt about the destiny of those who reject God's message and the truths revealed in the book of Revelation. For verse 16 states, I, Jesus, have sent mine angels to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The message of the revelation is true because Christ inaugurated and guarantees it. Who would dare question him? In this verse, the Lord also calls himself the root and offspring of David. As the root, he is David's Lord, the pre-existent God, Psalm 110.1. As his offspring, he is David's son, the incarnate Christ, Matthew 22, verses 41 to 46. Oh, this is a beautiful picture of the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is also the bright and morning star. In fact, Peter calls him the day star, 2 Peter 1, 19. Now listen intently, for this is deeply moving. God so loves sinners that his compassionate heart must extend the gospel call one last time before the book of Revelation closes. Oh, that modern-day ministers were as evangelistic as the Heavenly Father. Hear him. Verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. 
and let him as a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take up the water of life freely. I love it. In this text, God compassionately declares, believe in me. Come to me. Invite me into your heart and life. You have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Everyone and everything is pulling for you. One, the Holy Spirit is. Two, the bride of Christ is. Three, everyone who hears and believes is. Four, the glorious city in which the bride dwells is saying, don't you want me for your eternal home? Finally and fifthly, your own spiritual thirst is crying out, I want to be satisfied. Why not come and drink then? The water of life is free. It's without cost or obligation for everyone. And whosoever will may come. If you have rejected this invitation, if you have considered the message of the book of Revelation unimportant, or if you are among those who believe that the book of Revelation is not part of the canon of Scripture, that it is but a collection of riddles, simply a symbolic hoax, perpetrating a myth, beware, beware. For God himself warns one and all. In verses 18 and 19, listen to these solemn words. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy... God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city just described and from the things which are written in this book. What a strong judgmental warning. What a serious admonition from the Almighty to take the book of Revelation seriously. God means what he says and says what he means. One is not to meddle with or handle lightly the truths which means so much to the God of heaven and earth. For, verse 20, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. God's last promise as the book of Revelation closes is, Surely I come quickly quickly. When one sees the beginning of these events and the rapid succession of signs following speedily, Jesus will come quickly or suddenly. The response of his people is, Amen. This expression literally means, so be it. Jeremiah eleven five, And then they immediately add, even so come, Lord Jesus the final message to the church is that our Lord will return. Until this glorious event takes place and he calls us to himself in the twinkling of an eye, my prayer for every born-again child of God reflects the benediction of this blessed book of Revelation. Verse 20, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And amen. Oh, the book of Revelation. I trust that your heart has been blessed as much as mine as we've listened to Jack give the explanation to every single verse of this glorious, glorious book. Perhaps you have never made that all-important decision to open your heart to the Lord Jesus. If you haven't, this is our prayer that you will do this. And if you have and have strayed away from Him, I know that you've been encouraged to begin living for Him because the time is so very, very short. I know, Jack, you'll share with our people right now how to be ready. And Rexella, it's so simple. Clergymen want to make it hard, and they often ridicule evangelical Christians by saying, Oh, they have this little formula and they make it so simple. We believe it's much more difficult than that. Listen to me, folks. When the Apostle Peter was sinking into the ocean, he said to Jesus, Lord, save me. 
three words, and it happened. The thief on the cross hanging next to Jesus said in Luke 23, 42, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Nine words. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Over in Luke 18, verse 14, the publican of the temple said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Seven words. And Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, made right with God. So you see, it is simple. Could anything be simpler? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. Now, there are a few things you have to understand. Before you can be saved, you must recognize that you're lost. And that includes every member of the human race. The Bible says there is not one just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not, Ecclesiastes 7.20. They're all gone aside. They are together become filthy. There's none that doeth good. No, not one, Psalm 14.3. All we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah 53.6. And Jesus said, none is good except one. That's God, Luke 18.19. You admit that you're a sinner? All have sinned. How? By coming short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. All right, the next step is to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sin. 1 Corinthians 15.3 says, Christ died for our sin. 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bare our sin in his own body on the tree. Revelation 1.5, under Christ who loved us and washed us from our sin in his own blood. Now, there's something you need to do. Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, Lord, I am that sinner. I believe you died for me by the shedding of your blood for the remission of my sins. And now I call on you to be my Savior. Actions demanded. John 1, 12 says, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Will you do it now? Look at me. Pray this from your heart. Lord, I am a sinner, but I am blessed to know that Jesus died for me. He took my sin on his body at Calvary. He shed his blood to cleanse and wash me. Lord Jesus, I believe in what you did for me. I trust in you. I call in your name now. Lord Jesus, save me for time and for eternity. In your name I pray this. Amen. Oh, Jack, I pray that many of our friends just made that decision. And if you did, know what a wonderful walk you can have with him. Begin reading his word every day. Talk to him every day. And tell someone else about your decision. This is a beautiful little prayer. Lord God, as you prepare a place for us, prepare us for that place.